talks about the fragrance of the Lord and um, how often in the scriptures, this isn't part of the message, so guys, you no need to search for anything there, but um, just how often the fragrance, you know, incense they burned in the temple and, um, and, and in the tabernacle and, uh, you know, just how God has made us, hasn't he? And God could have made us with no sense of smell, couldn't he? We don't have to have a sense of smell to, to exist, but God gave us that ability to smell things. And how often does a sense of smell evoke memory? We go somewhere and we smell something. What is, what is that about? Oh, yeah, that's from my childhood. That, that, that smell of that cooking or something. And uh, it brings us back. And maybe I just hope that maybe when you smell rosemary, next time that that will evoke a memory of the lord's table for you of jesus sacrifice so you know uh, i think that's just something god can do for us can't he that um, he can just bring back to us things um, from just simply the way he's created us praise god well this morning <coughs> not surprising i guess uh, my my message is sacrifice amazing sacrifice un equaled and uh, obviously we're not only speaking around the Anzacs but we're speaking about the marvelous sacrifice of Jesus so let me begin with telling you a story a story that you may have heard before maybe not um, it's not about an Australian uh, it's about uh, a, a Polish man um, and this is the story on, on the last day of July 1941 the sirens of Auschwitz and I'm sure we all know what Auschwitz was that terrible concentration camp that death camp of the Nazis during the Second World War and the sirens rang out now announcing the escape of a prisoner from block 14 as a reprisal 10 of his fellow prisoners would die they would die a long slow starvation buried alive in a purpose-built concrete bunker. All day they would be there, just tortured by heat stroke, by hunger and by fear. And the men stood there waiting in the courtyard as the German commandant and his SS assistant walked between the ranks to select quite arbitrarily the chosen 10 from Block 14. As the commander pointed to one man, Franceskic uh, Gajanisek, he cried out in despair, my wife and my children. At that moment, the unimpressive figure of a man with sunken eyes and round glasses in wire frames stepped out of line and took off his cap. said, I'm a Catholic priest and I want to die for that man. I am old and he has a wife and children. I have no one, said Father Maximilian Kolbe. Request granted, retorted the commandant before moving on. That night, nine men and one priest went to the starvation bunker. Normally, they would virtually tear one another apart like cannibals but not so this time while they had strength lying naked on the floor the men prayed and sang psalms after two weeks two of the men and father maximilian were still alive the bunker was required for others so on the 14th of august the remaining three were disposed of at 12.50 p.m. after two weeks in the starvation bunker and still conscious, the Polish priest was finally given an injection of carbolic acid and died at the age of 47. It's not the end of the story. On the 10th of October 1982, in St. Peter's Square in Rome, Father Maximilian's His death was put in its proper perspective. 
present in the crowd of 150,000, including 26 cardinals, 300 bishops and archbishops, was Francis Gajovinich and his family. For indeed, many had been saved by that one man. The Pope describing Father Maximilian's death said this, This was a victory won over all the systems of contempt and hate in man. A victory like that won by our Lord Jesus Christ. When Francis Ganov Nicek died, aged 94, his obituary stated that he'd spent the rest of his life going around and telling people what Maximilian Kolbe had done for him, dying in his place. Amazing story, isn't it? Amazing. Brings humanity to a most inhuman period of history. Now, most people find acts of sacrifice deeply touching and stirring. Even the most self-centred individuals give recognition to those who have given of themselves for others, particularly if that means putting life and limb on the line. Today we focus on Anzac Day as a nation, along with our New Zealand brothers and sisters. And it's a day of giving thanks for those men and women who have helped defend the freedom of Australia and our allies but have also helped liberate the oppressed in many parts of the world. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to remember sacrifice in human terms, but also to remember your most great sacrifice. And so Jesus, as we come to your word, we pray that we would reflect with some solemnity but also with joy and thanksgiving, knowing that sacrifice always opens the door to better things. And we give you thanks and praise as we come to this word. Bless it to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's pull ourselves together. Come on. Not me, you. Every nation, of course, has their Anzacs, their heroes of sacrifice, every nation in the world, even Germany, of course. What can we say about such people and our remembrance of their deeds? Well, firstly, I really do believe the commemoration of human sacrifice that have been made is a worthy thing to do. It is a worthy thing to remember. There was a time in Australia when we didn't do it. Do you remember that? In the 70s. Do you remember that season in the 70s and 80s where it was considered to be a detestable thing to go to Anzac Day? Do you remember that? Sadly, I do. I was at school at the time. And my teachers, I remember teachers put down, you know, war. Oh, it's just a celebration of war. And there was a time, there was a, there was a decade or so where Anzac Day was not celebrated, particularly by the young as it is now. I, f I do remember that because I was in high school at the time. And Anzac Day was, was sold to us as a bit of a waste of time. Can you believe that? It was. But it is a worthy thing to commemorate sacrifice, to commemorate our great-grandparents, our grandparents, our uncles, our aunties, our fathers, our mothers who sacrificed in various ways. Second thing I'd say is that most did not go seeking death but they knew the risk and they were willing to take that risk for freedom's sake. But none of them went there saying, I hope I die, I believe I'll die, but they took a risk. They took a risk. And thirdly, I think that though their, their, their sacrifice and their service was extremely worthy, most worthy, it offered no guarantee of permanence as to the effect of their efforts. 
Who remembers what World War I was called? The War to End All Wars. But that didn't happen. Subsequent generations have had to fight again and again to maintain freedom from oppression. And that need may yet rise again. We have no guarantees. Praise God, as Western nations, we've had a, a long period of national peace. But we've still had to go into other places like the Middle East, haven't we? And other places and help others who are oppressed. You know, we certainly hope that our generation may be spared that, but none of us have a crystal ball concerning such things. And we know at the moment, in the season we live in, there's a fair bit of sabre rattling going on, isn't there? I'm not going to mention particular nations today, but there's a fair bit of sabre rattling going on. It's not unlike what happened in the 30s in Europe. I'll just say that. I hope it doesn't come to anything like that, obviously. Another thing I'd say is that sometimes instead of showing due reverence and gratitude and thankfulness to the people who have sacrificed, some have actually tarnished that sacrifice through ignorance, forgetfulness and cynicism. I thank you, I'm thankful that as Australian people, and in New Zealand as well I know, we have certainly moved beyond that and Anzac Day is highly regarded. There is greater turn up uh, pre-COVID there was greater turn up at Anzac services than there has been at any time in our history. It's greater representation and among the young. The pilgrimage to Gallipoli is huge and not as some kind of drunken pursuit of young people to go and just have an overseas holidays and drink themselves stupid. No, to have a very solemn pilgrimage. So I'm thankful that, that we, have, we are in that place. I'm thankful for you know, what, what was in the, 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 f the football matches on the weekend as people have stood. And I've been, in those, I've been in those Anzac Day services. The awesomeness of standing with, at the MCG with 100,000 people. And you could hear a pin drop. It's awesome. And it's, and it's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to do, to reflect on those things. But as we move forward in this message, as worthy and as memorable and as valuable as the sacrifice of our Anzacs has been, it must pale. It must pale against the greatest sacrifice of all, the sacrifice of Jesus. Let me identify for us some important areas of contrast. Firstly, in contrast to the Anzacs, Jesus' sacrifice was not only for family or cause or country, but it was for all humanity, for all time, as Wendy so ably brought out in her communion. Our VC winning brother did what he did for his Aussie mates, for his Aussie mates. Would he have done the same thing for enemy in the water to save their lives? We don't know. It's doubtful. But Jesus, Jesus, not for cause, not for country, not for family, for all humanity, even though we are against him. Romans 5.19 says, For just as though through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Revelation 5, 9 and 10 says, Concerning Jesus, with your blood you purchase men for God from every tribe, every language and people and nations, from Germany, from Japan, from Australia, from New Zealand, for every nation purchased with Jesus' blood. 
and you've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Hallelujah. Second contrast I'd make is that whilst many of the fallen in war did not know that they would ultimately give their life, Jesus did. Jesus did. He purposely and obediently gave himself to death. It was not a misfortune. It was not an accident in any sense of the word. Isaiah 53 gives us a clear prophecy of Jesus' death, 700 BC. 700 years before he would die on the cross, there was the prophecy, this will take place. In Matthew 16, verse 21 to 23, Jesus' own words, and in other places as well, prophesied his own death. He said, I am going to give my life. I'm going to die. We know Peter couldn't handle the truth of it. But Jesus certainly purposely went to his death. It was no accident. The third contrast I see there is that the sacrifice of the Anzacs could only grant us temporary respite from war. Just for that season. But Jesus' sacrifice was for once and for all. Never needs to be repeated. The Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the earth does not need to be slain again. <clears throat> once and for all. Its value, Jesus' sacrifice, its value is eternal. Hebrews 10.12 says, But when this priest, in contrast to the high priest of the old covenant, this priest Jesus had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God. It is finished. The work is done. The work is done. And lastly, the final contrast I'd make is that just as the sacrifice of the Anzacs can be made light of and diminished in its value, so can the sacrifice of Jesus. Those who reject Jesus, sadly, will pay a ter terrible price. Eternal separation from God. If they dishonour the sacrifice of Jesus, either directly or indirectly, they must endure eternal separation from God. As John 3.36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life for God's wrath remains upon him. The sacrifice of Jesus is in a sense pointless for us unless we receive by faith the fact that it was for us. It's no value to us unless we receive it. Jesus' sacrifice calls from humanity a response. He's done it, but it calls a response. We have to repent of our sinful life, which we have all had, all of us, no one is exempt, and then invite Jesus to come and be Lord over our life, our daily life, our ongoing life. Everyone needs to understand that Christianity is not a religion, not at all. It's not a religion. It's a personal encounter with the risen Jesus. It's a personal encounter with the risen Jesus. But you know, it's even possible for those of us who have received Jesus to, in a sense, devalue what he's done for us. How? And what can we do to ensure we're not guilty of such an, of such an offence to God? What can we as Christ followers do to ensure that Jesus' sacrifice for us was not in vain. Well, Hebrews 10 tells us, it says in verse 32 to 39, it tells us to lay aside whatever it is that's keeping us from developing a fuller relationship with him. This is one of the blessings and benefits of Red Letter Challenge to us. This is going to help us, not in any sense of good works or ticking boxes with Jesus, but helping us to, to dig deeper into what it means to be a Christ follower, to be one who walks with Jesus on a daily basis. 
We need to be willing, as the scripture exhorts us, to lay aside the weights that hold us. And we all experience those weights. I don't think we get to a place where we say sudden, I'm weight free. But you know, the things like unforgiveness, lust, pride, bitterness, selfishness, we can all again take that weight on ourselves again in our daily life. And Jesus' exhortation to us is, lay it aside. I've died for your freedom. I've died for your abundant life. So lay it aside. But sometimes you and me, we can be a bit disobedient and say, well, I just think I'll just hang on to that weight in case I need it later. (laughs) But the writer of Hebrews exhorts us, lay aside every weight. And we can only do that by daily reflections with God and just having those times of prayer and saying, God, examine my heart. And God might surprise us sometimes and say, there's a weight there. Say, oh, I'd miss that. Well, there it is. What are you going to do with it? And God deals gently with us. Praise God that, that condemnation is always of who? The devil. God doesn't condemn us. But does God does convict us and says, hey, I, I need you to tune that. You're still my son. You're still my daughter. We haven't lost relationship. You're not outside my salvation. But I need you to tune that thing. You know, your violins sound a bit squeaky. Tune it up. Tune it up. God will always meet with the person who comes to him in humility. Always. Always. If the recent Easter season teaches us anything... It is that Jesus has not come to condemn us. We can draw close to him through prayer, through reading the word, by doing something like Red Letter Challenge and most importantly through the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. He longs to draw closer to us in the same way as a parent loves to draw close to their natural children. I would encourage you today you know here or i think everyone here probably knows jesus but maybe online if um if you don't have a relationship with god today then all you need to do is simply bow your heart before him most importantly not so much your head but your heart before him and say god i recognize that i'm a sinner but i acknowledge that you died for my sins you died in my place Come into my life. Make me your son. Make me your daughter. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Heal me. I receive you. I receive your salvation in Jesus' name. It's as simple as that. Everyone, the youngest child can do that. I've prayed with five-year-olds who have been able to understand what Jesus did for them. So we certainly can. And if as a believer... We feel that we have strayed a bit in our attitudes or in our actions, then today is a day to make sure that Jesus' sacrifice for you is having its full effect, its full effect in your life. You know, it'd be a shame if we rejected or neglected the relationship with the Father that Jesus died to make possible. That would be a shame. Let's stand together as we close in prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we thank you. Lord, this is an emotional day for most of us and some, some of us even more so because we actually, we actually lost family. We lost loved ones in some of these conflicts. But, Lord, for all of us, it's an emotional day because we reflect upon that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we're so grateful for that, Lord. We're so grateful for that remembrance. Lord, may you, even as we smell this rosemary on our person and maybe in a later time, we might, as we smell that again, we'll say, oh, we remember what Jesus did for us. So, Lord, we pray for that. We pray for everyone here, Lord, who who is just seeking to walk closer with you, that you would help us, Lord. We need your grace. We're insufficient of ourselves. We need your grace in our daily lives. So, Lord, we pray, pour it upon us as we receive it with thanks. 
Lord, as we go out into this, this day and this week, Lord, may we go forward with thanksgiving. May we carry the, the glow of Jesus upon our lives, that people may see us, that they may be touched even by the presence of Jesus in us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.